Hi everybody, I'm Ann Campbell, and I am here on, um, in my role as board member for um, Common Twin Tiers, which is how we fondly call the Susan G. Common Twin Tiers region. And um, this is a completely different kind of failure story, and um, I have to say it's really, I mean, we're all, all the speakers today are really tough acts to follow. Um, it's been such a pleasure, and Randy, thank you so much for the opportunity. So. Um, Give me a drink, please. This just uh, gives a little indication that this is not going to be as heavy as some of the, um, the fails that we've been talking about thus far. Um, so just a little bit about Common Twin Tiers. Um, we, you know, we serve nine counties in New York and Pennsylvania. Um, so it's pretty really broad geographic er area. We are the, the um, leading regional breast cancer foundation. We're small and new. Um, we had our first um, full-time employee in 2011. We now have a, one full-time and one part-time employee. Um, we are primarily volunteer-driven, and um, we do a lot of good. Since 2000, we've given over a million dollars um, to regional breast health initiatives um, to local nonprofits. Um, but for all that time, about 75 to 80 percent of our revenues are generated through one annual event, our Race for the Cure, which takes place in Elmira each May. Obviously, from an organizational sustainability standpoint, that is not a good model. Um, so, <laughs> so as a, as a strategic goal for the organization, um, we started to build a plan toward more ongoing um, revenue um, generation throughout the year. Um, and in 2013, we added several new events, one of which I was chairing. Um, and we um, felt we had a really great model. We called it our pink tie affair. Um, and it was for us, you know, this, again, the very first higher end fundraiser, um, very exciting, and um, was scheduled for September of 2013. Well, we had a great model for success. We felt we had a, a phenomenal committee, you know, strong event planners, people who've done this before. Um, we had a great venue partner in the National Soaring Museum. We were so excited to be having our event there. We found a great caterer um, from the Ithaca area. Um, most importantly, we secured 16 gentlemen, regional community leaders, to, uh, who agreed to be our pink tie guys for the evening. Basically, each of them committed $1,500 um, were able to invite eight of their guests, and that was how we knew we would have the financial success that we needed um, to make our, our event successful. Um, we anticipated about 200 guests. We were tickled pink with our planning. We were right on target, you know, two weeks before the event, we were putting together our silent auction items. Um, we, were, we felt we were in really, really great shape. Um, we thought we'd net about $25,000, so we were, we were really feeling good. So, just to backtrack a little bit. In our earlier discussions, our committee decided that because of the, 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 the um, sort of demographic of most of our pink tie guys, it would be nice to have, in addition to complimentary beer and wine at our event, we would also have a cash bar. So those who wanted to have a cocktail could have a cocktail. We thought that would be a, a nice thing. The committee member who was communicating with our caterer um, asked them to do both the cash bar and the beer and wine service um, and was told that they couldn't do the, the, the cash bar. So we were looking for alternative sources for that, resources for that. Um, time was starting to tick away. And um, we still hadn't seen even our menu from the, the, the caterer. So we were, you know, but we had been in communication. Our, our committee member in charge of that was talking to them. We knew it was coming. We had good faith in them. We had talked about the um, liquor license. And we all, we had talked about it several times. We knew, of course, that the caterer would be getting that. Um, but we ended up deciding that the cash bar wasn't going to happen, largely because we had run out of time for them to get a liquor license. It had to be done separately. So what happened was one week and one day before our very first higher end 
fundraiser, we learned, well, the caterer had not applied for a liquor license. We had not applied for the liquor license. No one had applied for any liquor license. Forget the cash bar. We might not have beer and wine <laughs> for our cocktail fundraiser, which is just not acceptable. <laughs> who are in the nonprofit world who have planned a fundraiser dealing with the New York State Liquor Authority, you don't mess around. Do you mess around? You don't mess around. They, when they say 15 days, the application has to be in, the, the application has to be in. So we were just stunned by this, um, this failure, this failure to, you know, to communicate between us somehow we couldn't even figure out who dropped the ball. It was just dropped. <laughs> um, so we got on the phone immediately with the liquor authority. We, t we begged. We sobbed. We basically told them our whole ordeal. And in fact, they told us that we, you know, they weren't out to put us out of business. They really might be able to help us out. Um, they gave us a long laundry list of things that we had to provide in an application in full that day um, to overnight to them. And of course, we put everything aside to do just that. We sent it off to the address in New York City that, it was, that we were told it was supposed to go to and got on the phone with them the next day to see if they had received it. And in fact, it was supposed to have gone to Albany. Holy cow. So again, Everything was in place. We had sent it to them in PDF form, but that didn't wasn't good enough. So we waited. We waited. So this is now. The event is Friday. This is Monday. We learned that they haven't received it. Uh, on the one hand, I would say our friends at the Liquor Authority were very kind to us. They were reassuring, but we didn't have a liquor license, and we knew we couldn't serve. And we had to, we had to have alcohol at our fundraiser. Um, so they, they really were, were, were kind to us. Um, they told us we could, uh, 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 and then the day continued, the, the week continued to go along. Pink tie guy, day number seven, we, we filled the application. Day number five, we learned it was wrong, and we talked to them again. And one of the things that we did was we, we, we didn't even let on to our whole planning team that this had happened. A couple of people who found out were just trying to deal with it. Event planning was continuing to go on. We we had to hold the event. We had no um, you know no alternative, and we were really receiving some um, reassurance from from the liquor authority that we we would be okay. Um, and then finally, on the day Thursday before the Friday event, we did receive the liquor license. So this is really more of an almost fail. I mean, it was really close. <laughs> I promise. Um, and ultimately, yay, we were really, we did have a very successful event, and it, it netted actually um, just around $30,000, which we felt great about. There was plenty of beer and wine for all. <laughs> um, at this point, the fact that we, our invitation said cash bar was just so not important to us. So, and that was our original stress. Oh no, we don't have a cash bar. No. Um, and so the lessons we learned. Um, do not make any assumptions, and I think I've heard that over and over and over again this afternoon. Um, you know, in your critical, in your communications with critical partners, um, and we again, we had talked about this. We had said, you know, we all knew it needed to be done. It's just we all felt someone else was doing it. Um, establish better checks and balances. Um, you know, you just have to make sure that it's all checked off. You do not mess with the liquor authority. Um, <laughs> But all in all, this was an almost fail, and in the grand scheme of things, it was a minor thing. Um, but we hope you'll join us next fall. Where, <laughs> and this is not really true. I said the liquor license has already been applied, <laughs> but it hasn't. <laughs> Any questions? We did. We thought we talked about po those possibilities, but our venue partner was such a fabulous one. We hated to pull out on the Soaring Museum because this was a really good um, opportunity for visibility for them as well. So we really would have regretted doing that. But yes, of course, we thought of every eventuality. And in the back of our minds, we were fortunate that we 
were on a daily um, communications basis with the liquor authority contacts, and they were being reassuring. I mean, they I, they weren't going to let us truly fail. But yeah, yikes. <laughs> Yes, Quinn. What do you predict the outcome would have been if you couldn't serve alcohol? <laughs> now that is a fine question. Um, I think we probably would have, we would have moved the venue rather than not being able to serve. I think it would not. It, it just would have been. It was the expectation for that kind of event was you have to have beer and wine. But that's a good question. Anybody else? Thank you.